terms of the contract? Well, really so far, we've been dealing with whether or not we've actually had a contract formed. The terms of the contract, do you try to give us some understanding of the details of the, the agreement? We're actually looking at the rights and obligations of the parties that are actually involved, and that's why it's fundamentally different. When we're dealing with terms of a contract, we can really see that there's two kinds of terms, express and implied. Within implied, there's two kinds of implied terms. There are terms implied by the courts, and there's terms implied by statute. Now, the terms implied by the courts are something we're not going to deal with in BSB 111, and the terms implied by statute, we're going to deal with next week, week 10. So really, uh, this section of the course is about the express terms of the contract. Express terms um, don't necessarily have to be in writing. They just need to be express, not implied. So it just means to me they need to be outwardly visible. So it can be in writing, and in particular, the best kind of terms are those where we have a signed written contract. Okay, so if you've got a signed written contract, fairly clear what the express terms uh, involved in what's written down are. We can then have express terms which are oral, or we can have express terms which are in writing but are not part of a signed written contract. Now in either of those cases, whether it's oral or written but not in a signed written contract, um, the terms of the contract need to be brought to the attention of the parties. If we don't have that, then they won't be considered terms of the contract. Let's deal first with the easiest situation, where we have a term that is actually uh, written and in a signed contract. In those instances, um, it will be a term of the contract. It's a term of the contract even if the other party hasn't read the contract, so doesn't know the terms in there. We saw last week, under the non est factum rule, that the courts are loath um, not to allow a written signed contract to form um, and stand on its own as evidence of the agreement of the meeting of minds. We noted that in the non est factum rule, right, we can really only overcome that when it's so fundamental that we say, well, this is not my deed, this is not my contract. They must mistake the entire document that they signed. Not only that, there must be a very good reason why they didn't sign it. Um, either they couldn't, couldn't read it due to a lack of, say, English or illiteracy or a vision impairment, or, you know, they were fundamentally tricked into signing it. They're the only two ways you get out of it. It's not only that they didn't read or sign it, um, but they were also mistaken as to the very nature of the contract that they were really signing. So unless you're in one of those scenarios, the written contract that has a term in it, that term's going to stick. And a case to help us think about that is Lestrange and Graucop. So the case to help us think about this is Lestrange and Graucop. And as you can see here, it's all about the sale of a cigarette vending machine. In fact, L agrees to purchase the... L agrees to purchase the cigarette vending machine from Graucop. So the machine is going to go this way and he's going to pay for it that way. So Lestrange is going to pay for this cigarette machine. Now, the written contract contained the following words. This agreement contains all the terms and conditions under which I agree to purchase the machine specified above. And any express or implied condition, statement or warranty, statutory or otherwise, not stated herein, is hereby excluded. So we really had an exclusion clause that said the only things that can be relied on are what is written in this particular contract. And Lestrange signed that contract without reading it. In the end, the machine didn't work properly, and Lestrange sues Graucub for breach of contract, namely the implied term that the machine would be reasonably fit for the purpose that it had been bought for. So, despite the machine not working, despite the fact that Lestrange uh, did not read the contract, the court in this case held that Lestrange was bound, so L was bound um, by 
the exclusion clause. And the fact that Lestrange hadn't read it didn't matter. Lestrange should have read it, had an opportunity to, and didn't. So, if anything's written and signed in a contract, we're pretty sure it's going to be a term. Very, very rare exceptions, and they've really got to go to the heart of the contract. A slightly different case to non s factum that we need to be aware of it occurs where someone looks as though they've been tricked into signing a contract or, or led to believe that what they're signing isn't contractual in nature. And a good case for this is Le Mans Grand Prix circuits and Iliadis. So we have uh, the customer here, um, Iliadis, going to uh, Le Mans Grand Prix circuits to race some go-karts, as we have here. And before he can race the go-kart, before he's allowed to race the go-karts, he's asked to sign a document. And at the heading of the document are the words, um, to help with our advertising. Okay, so that's really, really important. So if you saw those words, you're really not gonna think um, that what you're signing is actually a contract. He was also rushed to sign. Now, what happened is, on that document that he signed that was headed to help with our advertising, there was also um, a, a liability exclusion clause. And so it basically said that if anything went wrong, Le Mans wouldn't be reliable um, if Iliadis was injured. Well, unfortunately, he was injured. And so we have to work out, does this liability exclusion apply or does it not apply? And you'll know from what we've been talking about with express terms that the courts are loath not to uphold uh, an express term on a written and signed document, which is what we actually have here. Fortunately for, for Iliadis in this particular case, the courts didn't see it that way. They actually said uh, in this instance, Iliadis wasn't bound by the written contract for three key reasons. The first reason was uh, the document uh, didn't look like a contract. So it didn't look contractual in nature. So, so the heading that it actually had about being for advertising was really important. So there's an element there where he was, well, I wouldn't want to say misled, but it's very close to being misled. Second, he was rushed. Okay, so he wasn't given enough time to actually read the document. And the third thing was that the term wasn't brought to his attention. And it's a pretty important term. So you put those three things together. It's not just about um, being misled or not reading it or, or the cause of not reading it, but also maybe they would have uh, been able to uphold the cause if it had been brought to their attention. And we're gonna talk about reasonable notice in a minute. So what they're saying is, you know, really it's missing the two elements that are required. One element for the written contract, because it really didn't look like a contract and he was rushed, so there's an element of non s factum. And the second part is, well, even if it wasn't a written contract, surely he was given notice. And they said, well, it wasn't brought to his attention, so he wasn't given that reasonable notice. So in these kinds of cases, and remember they're very limited, we had the heading to help with our advertising, which was uh, made it seem not like a contract. So where there's an element of being tricked into signing uh, a document, you may the, the terms set out in that document may be set aside or not applied. 